So Genesis chapter 50, uh, as we finish up Genesis here, I already started reading into Exodus. Uh, the last time I taught it <laughs> was in 2018, so I got some stuff to learn. It's great. <laughs> uh, this is wonderful. Uh, but in this last chapter here, it says that Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him. Remember, Jacob's died. He's passed from the scene. He's given this great prophecy on all of his kids, on the, the tribes of Israel, and what was going to happen to Israel in the future, as well as uh, during their own lives. Uh, and we've uh, taken a peek at that. And it says that Joseph then, because his father had passed, uh, remember, he was 17 years without seeing him. Uh, he came back, dwelled in Goshen, uh, in Joseph, uh, just redeeming that time that he had with his father. And it says that he fell on, upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. And 40 days were fulfilled for him. For so are the, so, for so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him threescore and ten days. So it took 40 days for them to embalm him. I can't imagine. That, that, that's a long time <laughs> to put stuff into a man, but he had some traveling to do. Remember, he was going to go home. And we look at this and of course we see Joseph as a type of Christ. We see all these things that are going on. Uh, in that sense, and we see spiritually that, that there's more to it than just the, the death of a man, that there's other things that are going to be happening too. And as we look at those things, we realize that God has so much in his word that we still don't understand. Uh, there's so many things that he's going to teach us, and I can't wait for his studies. Uh, I, I've heard mine. I don't like them. <laughs> I love his. Uh, and, and so when he teaches us, we're really going to be able to learn something uh, but here in this place, 40 days for embalming, and they then they mourned for him uh, 70 days. Wow, a long time that's, that's gone on here. And, and when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If I have now found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die. In my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. Now, therefore, let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father, according as he had made you swear. <laughs> and again, for the wording, as you look at this, you hear them say, Let me take him up. And whenever you go to Israel, it's always up. <laughs> Whenever you leave Israel, it's always down. <laughs> and, and the same thing spiritually for our lives when we're going towards the things of the Lord, because remember, he calls Israel his land. It's God's land. It's not man's land. It's God's. <laughs> so whenever we're going towards where he is, towards who he is, we're always on an upward trend. Whenever we're walking away from the things of the Lord, whenever we're despising the things of the Lord, it's always a downward spiral. And the longer we stay, the worse it gets. <laughs> uh, you know it from your own lives. We know it in our own lives that these things happen in their spiritual things. That's why it's so important for us to stay on track with who he is and always go his direction. Not to go our own because our own ways cause heartache, they cause damage. They cause destruction, but we see man's ways, and we just look at them and see how awful they've become. And we see the highlight of man's ways is Super Bowl Sunday. What a highlight. <laughs> and next year, you won't even remember who is in the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> it's amazing how quickly we forget. And aren't you glad God doesn't forget who you are? Mm. So thankful for the Lord for his ways. He says, let me go up, I pray thee, bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh says, go up and bury your father, as, according as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. What an entourage. 
<laughs> that's just taking this short trip from Egypt to Canaan. They're going up, and the Egyptians are going, the family's going, everybody's going up. So, so amazing. But as they take him there, remember what the Lord says about us, that he's going to bring us to the promised land, that this is not our home, and we're going to move. So spiritually, we look at this and we see that this is not the place of our final destination. This is not the end for for you and I as born-again Christians. If, if you're truly in that place where you're born again, where you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, where you're in that place that, that God has become your refuge and your strength and your hope, your salvation, that this is not the last place that you're going to be. For us, heaven is our destination. We're just sojourners and pilgrims here in this world. And I'm so thankful that this is not the best that it's going to get. Can you imagine if this today was the best that you had? Yuck. You're all old enough where everything's falling apart. If this is... Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> if this is the best it's going to be, we're in real trouble. Because I hate to see what the worst is going to be. And the worst is going to be the wrath of God being poured out upon mankind and dwelling in hellfire for eternity, where the fires of hell are never quenched and the worm dieth not. Oh, thank you that we have a better outlook than that. Amen. <laughs> so they go up to bury him. All these people come. And it says in verse 8, In all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. Uh, amazing. The adults go. They leave the kids there. They leave the flocks there. And, and when we get to Exodus, which if the Lord tarries, we'll get to Exodus next week. When we get to Exodus, what do we see happening with Moses? He doesn't want the little ones left because what does Pharaoh say? Leave your little ones here. <laughs> no, not going to happen. He says, leave your flocks and your herds here. No, not going to happen. God wants all of it because it's all his and isn't that so sweet that he doesn't want any of who we are left here in this world? Jesus said in his high priestly prayer in John 17 that he's lost none. And aren't you thankful as you cry out? And maybe you feel this morning that you're just a waste of time, that you're a waste of, of breath for God to have for you because you haven't done anything for him and you don't feel like you've accomplished anything for him. If you're born again, he is not going to lose you. You're going to heaven. There's none of us that are a waste to him. We're all precious in his sight. And just be thankful that he loves you. Be thankful that he died for you. And that's why we celebrate communion every Sunday. One of the reasons is that we would remember what God has done for us. That even if we feel awful, he still loves us. He has a perfect love. And he's going to bring us home to heaven as we walk with him. And so they... They leave Goshen, they, they go up, and it says in verse 9 that there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan. So they've entered into the land, and there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation, and he made a mourning for his father seven days. Uh, Atad means thorny bush. One of the meanings of it is thorny bush. And as you look at it, what happened when man sinned? Thorns and briars sprang up in the land. And so even in the promised land, even in this land that's there, there's these thorns and, and everything else that's going on because of man's sin. Man's sin spread everywhere. But God is going to redeem that one day. And he's going to put it back the way that it was supposed to be. Can you imagine looking at this world with no thorns, no pricker bushes? Oh, no weeds. Oh, <laughs> it would be wonderful. Went out yesterday because it was so nice and just started doing some digging and, and starting to get some of the flower beds ready. And it's just, oh, this is nice. Get rid of these weeds. I'm sitting there pulling those stupid things out, and they don't want to budge. <laughs> and it just, oh, you know, as soon as you're done, there's more that are going to spring up in their place. And it's just, oh, how awful. Can you imagine Adam in that place? in the garden, and the Lord told him to dress the garden and keep it. But there's no weeds. Ah, what a wonderful place to be, and to stay there and then to walk in the cool of the day with the Lord and walk through the garden. And yet, 
sin enters in and he loses that companionship, he loses that relationship, he loses that place that God had for him, that special place. But he made a way for Adam. Because remember, he's the one that clothed them. He's the one that gave them clothing. In their wisdom, they put, picked up fig leaves and covered themselves. He gives them soft clothing. But he had to kill an animal. There had to be a sacrifice. And for you and I, there had to be a sacrifice too for our sin. And God provided that. He gave himself as a lamb for you and I. <laughs> And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, This is grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore, the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. Uh, so they took the name and changed it. Uh, it was a grievous mourning place. Um, and, and his sons did unto him according as he commanded them. For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham brought with a, bought with a field for a possession of a bearing place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that w went up with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. He's faithful to his word to come back to an idolatrous king, to come back to that place of being faithful in it. We see Nehemiah do the same thing. He was sent by the king to come and, and build the walls and, and build Jerusalem back up again. Uh, and he said, I'll come back. God's people need to be faithful. God's people need to be faithful not only to the things of God, but to the things of the world that we've promised that we will do. And be careful what you vow, because God wants you to keep those vows. <laughs> and we make those things we call New Year's resolutions, which we break by the 2nd of January. But it's... Those things, he says, I want you to be faithful in your vows, all your vows. Lord, help me to be faithful. And I can't be faithful in my own strength. I can't be faithful to my God. I can't be faithful to you. I can't be faithful to my family without the power of the Holy Spirit working in me. And so get yourself before the Lord and just ask the Lord's anointing on your life. That his Holy Spirit would fall upon you, would anoint you afresh, and just give you a fresh feeling to walk today being faithful. Don't worry about tomorrow. There's enough evil there. Worry about today. Lord, help me to be faithful right now in what I'm doing today. Mm. But help us to be a faithful people. Because the world needs to see something that's faithful. The world needs to see something that's right. We've got a UN agency <laughs> that's supposed to be partaking in, in making peace in the world. And yet, e even yesterday, Israel found arms that they had stashed there for Hamas to use against Israel. And it's a UN agency. And we know the corruption that's in there because anything that man makes is corrupted. Anything that man does is going to be corrupted because man's interests are involved in it. We need to be careful. What we support, what we look at as being right, there's only one thing that's right. And it's God in his ways. No matter how good man seems to want to make things, they are going to be tainted. They are going to be put up for destruction later on. Don't put your hope in those things. And we've got the whole world crying out, and, and even our own president now putting a time limit on Israel to stop what they're doing. Israel cannot stop what they're doing because Hamas has one purpose, and that's to destroy Israel. There's still 136 hostages that haven't been released. And they think that many of them are still alive. They're, they're looking and, and thinking that there's probably still 90 alive, which means there's 45 or whatever number that have now died in captivity. I can't imagine those poor folks, the torture they went through. But we have people all around us who are being tortured by their own guilt, tortured by their own sin, tortured by the ways that the world has put upon them. Had a pediatric group in, in the news just the other day that have said that all these transgender therapies that the schools are forcing on the kids without parents' consent, the pediatric group says that all these remedies and all the counseling are doing absolutely no good for those kids. Hello. Hello. We already knew that. 
that's why you go to the word. You don't have to listen to the news and, and get your information and, and your your acceptance in the, the news. You get it from the word. We already know that that's wrong. And that it's going to do no good for anybody that enters into those things. And we have a whole world that's entering into so much sin and thinking that they can make themselves to be God. And we're here to be faithful stewards to show them that there is only one way. There's only one way of salvation, and that's through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not through any program. And education is wonderful, but education used in the wrong way is just like anything else. It's going to turn out horrible and cause destruction. Education is not the end. Jesus is the end. He's the beginning and the ending. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Hang on to him. Don't hang on to what the world gives you. Hang on to him. Look for his ways. And you may be in a place right now where you're, you're struggling with life, you're struggling with the things that are going on in your life, but look to Jesus because he has a way through this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he's going to be with us. You don't have to fear. And we have so many Christians that are fearful and struggling and hurting because we're not looking for God's ways. We're trying to do it on our own. You can't do it on your own. It's going to be a mess. <laughs> the more we try and do on our own, the more of a mess we make. Isn't it amazing? You know, we tell our kids to pick up and pick up and pick up, and our wives tell our husbands, pick up your clothes off the floor, at least get them into the hamper, and we go, what's a hamper? <laughs> what clothes basket? I never knew there was one here. We just throw wherever it is. But can you imagine what God is looking at? Please pick up. Pick up my word and let it become life to you. I'm so excited we're, we're going on to Exodus. I'm even looking forward to it. Not enough to say, don't don't come now, Lord. <laughs> I'd still rather have him come. But, but it's so exciting to get into a book and, and to just dig in again and start looking at God's word in a fresh way. Even though I've gone through it, I don't know how many times, I can't wait to get back into it again. This is good, Lord. Because every time you read his word, there's something new there, isn't there? There's words that pop out of your Bible that weren't there the last time you read it. Those were not there the last time. God, you, you put a new version in, in, in my stand here that I'm reading because we're all in different places right now than we ever used to be. We're all in, in different situations than we used to be, and the word is going to be used by God for us in a different way, but it's always for good if we allow it to. Don't stop reading. Don't stop crying out to him. Let him be your savior in every place that you're in. You can't save yourself. You can't make yourself better. He can. He's the one that cleans you and cleanses you <laughs> from all unrighteousness. Lord, help. <laughs> so we've got these these folks that, that go back to Egypt, Joseph being faithful. And it says in verse 15, And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us. Here we go. <laughs> Man's wisdom at its finest. We start thinking. <laughs> Stop thinking. It isn't worth it. Uh, just know what God says. Joseph will peradventure hate us after all this time of him loving on them, bringing them out of the place of starvation and famine that they were in, bringing them into the best parts of, of Egypt, giving them the best of the land for their flocks and their herds, giving them a separation place to, to be in so that they could grow as a family and grow together, not killing them for what they did to him. After all these years, they said, oh, now that dad's gone, Joseph is probably going to kill us. Really? And we know where those thoughts come from. Yeah. That's right. The guilt, the devil, the world, the flesh, all those things come in and just say, Look at what happens. And don't we worry about that. The older we get, we go, boy, if I start losing my mind, my wife will probably put me in a home. And I'll, what do you mean good? <laughs> Michael, you're supposed to be on my side. <laughs> if there was ushers, I'd call them and we'd probably take Michael out or something. I don't know. Good. Wow. <laughs> 
And, and we start thinking, but where are those thoughts coming from? They aren't coming from the Lord. They're coming from the enemy. Just to get our focus off of him and off of what's right and of what, what might happen, what could happen. And isn't that what's going on here with the brothers? Dad's gone. We might die now. Oh, the fears start coming back in. He might hate us. And he will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. Isn't it amazing that they've gone from a place where they didn't care what they did to Joseph, and now they're saying, we did evil to our brother. Their hearts have changed. Things have started to happen in their lives. They're starting to walk in truth. They're starting to realize all these things that are going on. But the enemy is twisting it to say, yeah, you did evil, so now you're going to die for it. No. God is a God of forgiveness. He's always good to us. And he's not going to leave you or forsake you. And he's not going to give up on you. So why do we think that we want to give up on him? Well, God, you haven't answered my prayers yet, so I'm going to give up on you and do it my own way. Oh, Lord, help us. (laughs) Uh, So they sent a messenger to Joseph. They don't go see him like they should have done. Being men of God, they should have gone and seen him. They send a messenger. Maybe he'll be nice to the messenger. They couldn't find a brother that that he was on the good side of, (laughs) so we'll send somebody else. Can you imagine the position they just put this messenger in? What if Joseph was going to kill him? He'd kill the messenger, and then they would know, and then they could run. (laughs) They're setting this guy up. Instead of doing what they should have done as a man... They send a messenger. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Uh, So they send a messenger saying, Your father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespasses of your brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil. And now we pray, Forgive the trespass of thy servants of God thy father. And Joseph wept when they spoke unto him. Isn't it amazing? I, I never read in my scriptures where, where Jacob said that to his sons. They're just trying to work things around and twist words so that Joseph will say, yeah, Dad did say that, didn't he? He must have said it to them while I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, just trying to work things around for their own benefit. They're scheming again. They're just like their father, dirty, sneaky thieves. And when we walk in the flesh, we're all dirty, sneaky thieves. And we will do anything to preserve ourselves and to make ourselves look better than somebody else. Lord, help me. I am who I am. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I don't get any better than that. (laughs) I'm always going to be a sinner, always in need of salvation. And thank you, Lord, that you're the God of my salvation. Uh, But look at Joseph's response. He wept. Does it remind you of somebody when he came before Jerusalem? The shortest verse in the New Testament, Jesus wept. He wept over Jerusalem because they were not going to realize who he was. They were going to crucify him. Instead of accepting him as Lord and Savior, they were going to kill him and try and destroy him. We will not have this man to rule over us. And we say that in our hearts and we think, that's awful. (laughs) I would never say that. Well, we did before we came to salvation. We all said it. I'm not going to have Jesus rule over me. I want my fun. I want my drugs. I want my booze. I I want life. (laughs) You don't have life till you have Jesus. You have a death sentence. The only time we get life is when we come to Jesus and accept him for who he is and have him accept us, sinners in need of salvation. Joseph wept. And and shouldn't that be our heart as we see this world? And as much as we hate the rules and regulations that are being passed, as much as we hate the things that are going on, our hearts should be breaking for the condition of the world because it's just because of sin that this has happened. And the people that we're looking at the most, our government, the world leaders, they're sinners in need of salvation. And yet they're doing what they do naturally They're just doing what they do. They're just walking along in this world thinking this is it. They need Jesus. And our hearts should be breaking. 
Jesus didn't weep over Jerusalem because they were all saved and going to heaven. He wept over Jerusalem because they didn't want heaven. And they were going to miss out on the very best that they could have. And you and I sometimes miss out on the very best that we can have because we don't allow Jesus to be who he is in our lives all the time. We take things into our own hands. We, we do things on our own without looking to him. And when we do that, he weeps because we're entering into that place of saying, no, God, I'll do it myself. Oh, so sad. And yet that's where we are. That's why we need that relationship with Jesus so much so that we can represent him well, that we don't get mad at the world leaders, that we don't start protesting and carrying signs around because all that shows is that that we don't have a God that can do something. (laughs) We're trusting ourselves and our picket signs more than we're trusting God to do something. Lord, help me to just be led by the Spirit and not walk in the flesh. So his brethren also went and fell down before his face. So his dream comes to pass one more time. Remember his dream where the whole family was going to bow down before him. (laughs) And here it is coming to pass again. And they said, Behold, we be your servants. We'll do anything to stay alive, won't we? Do you think they meant it it in their hearts? We'll bow before you as long as you keep us alive. But if you keep us alive, we're going to hate you for who you are. (laughs) Oh, so sad Hmm. and joseph said unto them fear not or am i in the place of god where there's fear there's no faith and where there's faith there's no fear you don't have to have fear if you have faith in your god and we trust him for who he is and what he says he is we don't have to have any fear that's why we have people in the fox's book of martyrs who could stand and be tied to a stake and burned alive just thanking the lord for his faithfulness we could have moms crying out as they see their children tied to the stakes and say don't be afraid you'll be home soon you can't do that in fear you can only do that in faith of a god who's real and true do you know he's real today is he real in your life today is he bigger than your cancer is he bigger than, than your disputings is he bigger than your fears if he is then trust him God, I don't have a chance without you. Do you realize? <laughs> you you can't do anything right. And I hate to burst your bubble, because some of you probably think you can do something right. You can't, and neither can I. I can't do anything right outside of Christ. It's only him and his ways. He says in verse 20, But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. They sold him as a slave, as a young boy. They took his father's coat off of him, lied to their father, sent him away with traitors. They were going to kill him. They were angry, bitter men. And yet Joseph, in that place where there was not one other believer that we know of, was so settled in his walk with the Lord that he forgave him and said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Is that how your relationship with God is? That if the world comes against you, if if cancer comes in, if hurt comes in, you can say, the world means this for evil, but God is working it for good in my life. Because God works all things to the good for those that love him and they're called according to his purposes. Can you say that today? Can I say it today? On a good day, maybe. (laughs) How about on those bad days when you're worn and tired? Can you still say that? Lord, you mean it for good. Thank you. When you get done with all the trials and you sit there and you go, Lord, I am so bushed, I can't move another muscle. And the phone rings one more time and one more accident happens. And one more child calls and says, I'm in trouble. Can you rise up and say, God is using this for the good? Mm. When everything comes together, can you still say, God, you're still good? And it's all the time. Oh, when we're weak, then he's strong. Mm. Lord, help. Help us to get there. And that's what he wants to do with the church is to get us to that place. Because we are entering into times where it is not going to get better. If God doesn't do something with America soon, we're going down the tubes. We're already on that downward spiral. But that penny is spinning faster and faster and faster. And it's almost at the bottom for America. Things are not good for us. 
but God is still good. And, and even if the bottom falls out for us, God is still good. He doesn't change. Are we going to change and say, God, even though I have absolutely nothing right now, you're still good. Because when you can do that, you're on the right road and walking in the right direction, and God is going to bless and encourage and strengthen you for the next step. God, I can't go one more step. I can't do one more thing. I have no money left. I, I have no no future. I have nothing. I just want to get rid of all this. And he says, I'll strengthen you, and you can take one more step. You can go one more inch. Oh. And when he does that, it's because he's your strength and not you. Because we can't do it, but he can. <laughs> You meant it for evil, God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. This isn't all about just us. It's about other people. That's what we're here for, to be a witness for those other people. Your family members, your neighbors, the people you work for, the people you work with. You're here for them. And so what does he say in the next verse? So Now therefore fear ye not. What's happened? They're in fear. (laughs) <laughs> what does God always say? Let me come to you in comfort. Don't be afraid. When Joseph was sold as a slave and they took him to Egypt, what did God say? Don't fear. When Joshua was coming into the land, don't fear. When you're coming into a new time in your life, a new disease, a new hurt, a new death in your family, a new catastrophe in your life, what does he say? Don't fear. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, thank you, Lord. Now, therefore, fear you not. I will nourish you. That means he's going to give us our sustenance. But God, I don't see it in my future. (laughs) doesn't matter what you see. It matters what he says. Mm -hmm. And your little ones. It means there's going to be family members coming. And he comforted them. There's nourishment. There's family. There's comfort. Oh, thank you, Lord. (laughs) <laughs> and he spoke kindly unto them. Aren't you glad God speaks kindly unto you instead of what I speak to you? <laughs> you better do this. <laughs> he speaks words of comfort, words of joy. And Joseph dwelled in Egypt. He and his father's house and Joseph lived 110 years. No, thank you. Lord, please, sooner than that. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, his son, remember, uh, of the third generation, the children also of Mekir, the son of Manasseh, which were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you. As he's dying, he speaks out prophecy. He still, after all these years, He hasn't given up his walk with the Lord or his trust of the Lord because at the end of it, he's speaking out God's words that God has given him for his family. He's still walking in truth. Can we say that? Now that I turn 70, I can retire and I don't have to read God's word anymore. Really? (laughs) I don't read that in my Bible. (laughs) All our days are to be spent in God's word, in his truth, walking in his ways. But, Lord, you, you, you don't know my condition. I can't see anymore. <laughs> but we still can walk. We can walk with him and in him. <clears throat> I die, God will surely visit you and bring you out of the land, unto the land which he swore unto Abraham and Isaac and unto Jacob. God is long-suffering He's lived 110 years. He's not back in in Canaan. He's not going back to Canaan except in a box. Isn't it amazing that he can still speak good things and comfortable things to the family? This is where you're going as you walk with him. And we can say that to each other. You may have it hard, but God is going to be your comfort. You may be hurting physically, but God is going to be your comfort. You may be strained mentally, but God is going to be your comfort. You may be hurting bringing dementia and Alzheimer's in, but God can still be your comfort. It's amazing in some of those places, as people have walked with the Lord all their lives, and there's documented things that go on in some of these homes where they are, that they start singing Amazing Grace or It Is Well With My Soul. 
and the people can do every word that haven't spoken in years as they sing that song and then they're done because God is still with them. God is still ministering to their hearts. God still cares for them. It doesn't matter your condition. It matters your heart. These are all issues of the heart that God wants to deal with in our lives. And Lord, help us to have the hearts after him like Joseph did, like the, the family is going to. God is going to visit you. He's going to bring you out just like he swore he would. And aren't you glad he's going to bring us home to heaven just like he swore he would? <laughs> Hallelujah. You have a God that's faithful. We can trust him. God is going to come get us, whether we go by death or whether we go in the group plan. It's okay. I'd rather go in the group plan because I, I don't like what might happen in death. <laughs> but God's got a great plan. <clears throat> you may not have insurance, but you got assurance. God's assurance. You trust him. And so Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones. You're going to carry me here because this is not my home. You're going to carry me home. And we've got a God who's going to carry us home. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. And he's able. Did you know he's able? If he can raise Jesus from the dead, it says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is going to raise you and I from the dead. Do you believe it? Yeah, I say it all the time. I didn't say, did you read it all the time? I said, do you believe it? Oh, in your heart. Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. Lord, I know you're going to come and get me. I trust you. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him. There's a 40-day embalming thing going on again. Can't imagine the stuff they put in him. Uh, and he was put into a coffin in Egypt. Isn't it amazing? We've come all this way. We start out in Genesis, God creating the world. And what does he make first? A garden. After sin comes in, we see at the end of this book, what does man do for man? He puts him in a box. Because that's the best man can do, is put you in a box. God has created something for man in the first chapter in Genesis Man puts us in a box. I'd rather have God's ways than man's ways. Paul tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. They can put this body in a box and let it rot. It's okay. I've got a new body, and I'm going to heaven. <laughs> this is not my home. I don't care what kind of box they put me in. You can burn me. You can stuff me. You can feed me to sharks, make me fish bait. I don't care. Because I'm not in there anymore. I'm home. <laughs> Who I am is in heaven. And the world does that, don't they? They torture, they kill, they destroy. They think that they've got you. And God says, oh no, this one's mine and gone. All the torture that those poor people, those poor hostages have in Israel. All the torture that the folks in Nigeria are going through. Nigeria is a hotbed for Islam and they're killing Christians daily they are not a good place to be and it doesn't matter how much they torture the christians and say hey we got rid of them now no they didn't god has got them and we look at it and go god why because i want to reach these people that are doing that i want to touch those people's hearts and show them that there's something better and i can take care of my children and you may think i'm going through so much right now god where are you and my own daughter has asked me that. Why did God take my son and my grandson? Honey, he took him because he wanted him. He can take care of you, but he isn't the one that killed him. Sin kills. God gives life. So we can't be in that place of doubting like the world does what God is doing. We can be in that place of trusting our God for what he's going to do. God, I know you're faithful. One day you'll show me what all this was about. But help me to trust you even through all of this. And we may not have the easiest of lives. <laughs> and if we stay here long, it's going to get worse. But we still trust our Jesus because he's still faithful. So, Father, as we come to you, as, as we see what man has done, as we see what the world wants to do to us, we realize more and more uh, that you're faithful, that you're true, that you gave us everything that we needed, but we sinned giving that all away. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. 
And as we come this morning, Lord, whatever condition we're in this morning, whether it's a condition of of physical or mental or spiritual things that are going on, we know that you're able to deliver us and to give us right hearts and right minds and right thoughts about the things that are going on in our lives, Lord. So help us with it. We have so much, and we have so much because you're faithful and good. So, Father, help us with it as we sit before you and and just meditate on the things that you've shown us this morning. May we just have your heart. May we know your heart, your way, and may we walk in the truth of it. Help us with those decisions that you're, you're showing us to make today. But help us to make a decision for you and not, and not to preserve ourselves or to keep ourselves, but a, a decision for you, Lord, to let you be God in our life. Help us with it as we prepare our hearts to take communion. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we do come uh, with hearts expecting you to perform all that you've told us, Lord. Not because we're something, but because of what you've done, Lord. That work on the cross was finished. You cried that out on the cross, Lord. It is finished. It is done. It is paid in full. The price has been paid and taken care of. And thank you, Lord, for taking our sin upon yourself so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. May we walk in those truths today, Lord, and as we take these elements, this bread that's broken, just reminding us of your body that was broken for us, this cup of juice that just shows us that your blood was poured out for us, that we can just sit before you today and realize the forgiveness that you have for us, Lord. And we just give you thanks that you love us, give you thanks that you've loved us, Lord, past tense, it's already a done deal, you've loved us with an everlasting love. Lord, may we love you in return with a love responding to your love, Lord. We give you thanks, we praise you, and we take these now in remembrance of you and all that you've done, your finished work. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake. 